Welcome to Machine Learning Data Lineage with MLflow and Delta Lake. Hi, my name is Richard Zhang. I'm a software engineer from Databricks ML platform team. Prior to Databricks, I was a software engineer in Hortonworks working on Apache and Bari. Before that, I was a software engineer in Open Text Analytics building the company's BI visualization shoot. Hi, everybody. My name is Denny Lee. I'm a developer advocate here at Databricks. I was previously a senior director of data science engineering at Kukur, uh, also principal program manager at Microsoft, um, uh, also known for what is Project Isotope, uh, which is also known as Azure HD Insight. So thanks very much for joining us. Back to you, Richard, for the agenda. Today, Denny and I will provide a brief introduction to MLflow and its model registry feature, as well as Delta Lake and its time travel feature. Then we will show a live demo on how to use various versioning features from these two frameworks to achieve data lineage in the machine learning process. We know that machine learning development is complex. To give a sense of it, this is a typical machine learning pipeline. You take your raw data, you do some ETL or featureize it for data prep, then you want to do some training with this data to produce a model and deploy this model to production, score it, produce a REST API serving layer, run it through Spark, et cetera. And then when you get new data, you will reiterate the process again. Many organizations using machine learning are facing challenging storing and versioning their complex ML data, as well as a large number of models generated from those data. To simplify this process, organizations tend to start building their customized machine learning platforms. However, even such platforms are limited to only a few supported algorithms, and they tend to be strongly coupled with the company's internal infrastructure. MLflow is an open source project designated to standardize and unify this machine learning process. As you can see that MLflow has four major components. ML project, packaging, formatting your uh, reproduced runs and make it available in any compute platform. MLflow models, it allows you to generate model format and standardize deployment options. MLflow tracking allows you to record and query experiments and log metrics and parameters. And finally, model registry allows you to uh, have a centralized repo to collaborate uh, in the model lifecycle management. Most machine learning library lets you save the model file, but there isn't any good software to share and collaborate on these files, especially with a team. If you are working alone, you can probably check the file into a Git repository. You may need to name the file somehow to keep track of your model versions. And hopefully it's still manageable because you need to actually remember what you did to come up with these versions of files. If you're working in a large organization with hundreds and thousands of models, and each of them has different versioning for many different reasons, this management, this management becomes the major challenge. You may ask that, where can I find the best version of this model? How was it trained? How to add documentation for it? And also, how can I collaborate with my colleagues to view the model? Inspired by collaboration software development tools like GitHub, we launched MLflow Model Registry, which is a repository and a collaborative environment where you can share and work on your model. You can register named models and create new model versions for your registered models. You can comment and tag your registered models and model versions. So people can collaborate with you to quickly find the latest version of the model and 
relevant information about that model. It also has a built-in concept of life cycle stages. Like each model, you can have versions that are staging, production, or archived. And it provides a theory of API for you to easily interface with the model registry. And you can do it automatically and test it with your CI CD pipeline. So the new workflow is that uh, as a developer, you log your model into the model registry and work with any type of model alone as you can uh, package it there. Then your collaborator can go to the model, manually view it, or use the automated tool to test it with the MLflow model registry API. Then the downstream user can safely pull the latest model after it's been reviewed and check it, if it works. Then you can also use automated jobs or serving services for uh, of your choice with your latest model to do some inference. And we can see that the data lineage through the MLflow model lifecycle is as follow. It starts from training data set you ETL'd from the raw data. You may have different versions of the training data. And relevant parameters and metrics as well as the model file can be logged in the tracking API. Then the MLflow tracking component. Then in the MLflow tracking components run details page, you can register a new model or create a new version of an existing model. Finally, you can manage different version of the model and their lifecycle stage in the MLflow model registry component. That is part for me. Let's welcome Denny to talk more about Delta Lake. Hey, thanks very much, Richard. So we have many sessions throughout Summit that talk about Delta Lake. So let's just focus on some of the key components here. Uh, what you really need for proper model data lineage is reliable data. And that's what a data engineer's dream is that they're able to process data continuously and incrementally as new data arrives in a very cost efficient way without actually needing to choose between batch or streaming. So underneath the covers, we're talking about Delta. What's Delta on disk? See, it's a transaction log that actually has your table. You see the del underscore Delta underscore log and the actual JSON files that you see there, plus the parquet files themselves. You, as you'll note, there's, there's the table versions and also optional partition directories that you're working with. The data files are actually your original parquet files that, that you're used to working with, but packaged together is now your Delta table that ensures asset transactions. So that way, not only do you have reliable data, but you also have a, tra uh, um, a transaction log that now we can go back and look at what the old data looked like in when you're modeling, watching your ML models as well. And so the key aspect of implementing atomicity is that you want to be able to make changes to your table as they're stored as ordered atomic units called commits, All right? You have your first file, the 000JSON here. Uh, then you have a second file, the 01JSON. If I'm adding one or two parquet files, that's recorded in the first JSON or the zeroth JSON. And the second JSON or the first 001JSON that actually records the removal of the first and second parquet files and actually adding of the third parquet file, all right? What we wanna be able to do is solve these conflicts optimistically if the two clients are trying to run each other at the exact same time. For example, you wanna be able to knock the record start version, the record read writes, any attempted commits, and if someone else wins, check if anything that you try to read has changed, as you can diagrammatically see here. So that's it for this, the slide portion of the session. Let's dive into the demos. In this demo, we're going to show you how to use MLflow model registry and Delta Lake time travel to handle data lineage in machine learning process. We will also show you how to use various versioning features from these two frameworks to troubleshoot data versioning problems 
to achieve reproducibility for your experiments. Here is a notebook where we are going to run some machine learning code with the, box, with the Boston housing data set prepared by Danny. The Boston housing data set contains a bunch of columns like crime rate, number of rooms, percentage of lower status population. Our objective is to use this data set to train a linear regression model and use it to predict home values. We have few uh, pre-run cells doing some data preparations and visualization. You can see that we create a data frame by querying the delta table and then convert it to a pandas data frame. From the scatter plot matrix here, you can see that the number of rooms and the percentage of lower status population are having positive and negative linear correlation uh, with the median value of the house as shown here and here. But we can see it even more clearly in the following two separate scatter plots here and here, uh, as well as on the bar chart that's showing the correlation uh, from all columns to the median home value. We then define a list of more readable column names and we drop all the rows without median home value for data cleanup. After reviewing the correlation coefficient matrix and scatter plots, uh, let's choose features that have a strong correlation to the median value. Let's say um, we will choose the columns with a, the absolute value of correlation coefficients uh, greater or equal than 0 0.4. And then we do a train test split, 80-20 uh, train test split for our training and testing data set. And here it shows that uh, um, we're gonna try different learning rates and choose the one that yields the lowest uh, RMSE. And we have two training session with uh, Ridge and Lasso regression respectively. And let's run the training sessions. As the training session is running, let's take a look at our training function. Our training function takes uh, our training and testing data sets um, and the regression type, uh, as well as the learning rate alpha. First, it creates a MLflow run and initializes the linear regression object based on the regression type. Then it fits the training data set and collects all the training prediction outputs. Then it calculates RMSE and R2 metrics and use MLflow API to log all the parameters and metrics. It also logs the linear regression object as a second learn flavored model. Finally, it creates a prediction error plot plus a uh, residual plot and log both of them as run artifacts using MLflow API. After the training process, um, we can see a list of runs showing in the, uh, the notebook run sidebar. Uh, let's choose uh, RMSE and let's sort um, ascending by uh, RMSE. And we choose the lowest RMSE and go to that run. Now we can see uh, the run details page. In the run details page, uh, we can see that uh, the parameter and uh, um, the metrics that we logged uh, in the notebook. And uh, in the artifacts section, we can see the ML uh, model file uh, indicating the uh, second learn flavor model we logged and uh, the PNG files um, for the plot. Uh, that we logged. Since this is the best run we have, let's register a model using this run. Uh, to register a model, we first select uh, the model folder in the run artifact section, and let's click register model and choose to create a new model. And let's use Boston housing demo as the new model's name, and let's click register. And we can see that uh, uh, the first version of this model has been created. 
let's wait for it to finish creating. Now it's finished creating the new version of this model, uh, which is like uh, basically the version one of this model. Um, let's go to the model version page. So this is the model version page. We can go back to the register model page and see that uh, version one is the only model version uh, we currently have. Uh, since I wanted to collaborate with Danny uh, on this register model, um, I'll give Danny uh, manage permission of this model. So add Denny here, and then I choose can manage, add him and click save. If we want to load this model in our notebook, we'll need to uh, switch this model to the production stage. So let's say uh, ship it. Okay, now our model is uh, in production stage. We can go back to uh, the notebook and there is a cell at the bottom uh, that we pick a, uh, uh, a row from our data set, our chain data set, and uh, uh, to test uh, the model uh, and see the prediction. Let's run this cell. As we can see that uh, the prediction is 23.7925 which is pretty good. So one thing I had noticed when working with this notebook is that as you can see from Richard's um, model, if I go ahead and dive into it a little bit, he was actually using a different version of SK Learn. He was actually using 0.22.1 and I actually wanna use a different version of it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back and rerun the whole thing and you'll notice that I can jump right into here and find the lowest RMSE. So I'm just gonna pop that open and I'm gonna quickly go ahead and jump this over to and deploy a different version of the MLflow model. All right, give it a couple seconds here. So I'm gonna grab this one this model, I'm gonna register this model, similar to how Richard had done it before. I'm gonna register it. And then now I'm on V2. It'll take a couple seconds for it to, to go through, just to make sure. I'll just take a look at it real quick. Transition that to production, so which will automatically Perfect, so now that I'm good to go, I'm gonna go back to my notebook, I'll close up the runs, and I'll go ahead and rerun this particular cell again. And as it, as it goes through, you'll see again, a value of 23.79, and based on the original median value of 17.8. But let's say now I want to go ahead and replace the null values uh, that we actually had. So remember that this particular Boston Housing Kaggle data set, there are 504 rows, but 333 of them actually has values, a medium value. Well, the remaining 180 or so uh, don't are null. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and instead use this particular model to update my table. So I'm gonna actually fill this with new values. And so here you go. So right now what I'm doing is I'm updating our delta table with, uh, in this case, it's matching by ID. I'm gonna update that value with the new um, values that were calculated using this particular model. So if I scroll down and take a look at the values, you'll notice that basically I have not only the original values inserted in, perfect. All right, let's scroll to the right here. Okay. You know, so with uh, either uh, one or two decimals or none uh, for the meaning value, but also the new values. If I scroll down, there you go. These are the new values that were predicted by our model, and we've inserted the back in. Now, fortunately for somebody like myself, this is probably a bad idea. Uh, but fortunately, because I'm using Delta Lake, I've actually saved all this information. 
um, because we actually kept the transaction, which Richard's going to show. But meanwhile, I'm just going to go ahead and hide the fact that I did this and delete the cells. Okay. So now I've got the updated data, which is sort of incorrect using the updated model. All right. Oh, and then let me go ahead and run this all over again. And I'm going to register the new model based on the updated data, which probably isn't the best idea. But again, uh, I've got a new uh, RMSC value. So let's just let it run through. And we'll see what ends up happening. I'll have the new results coming in and I'm going to register this as a third model. All right, perfect. So we're almost finished. Excellent. So now let's go back to this. I'll go back and choose RMSC. Now I have an even lower one of 4.331. I'm going to make this my new model. So I'll go back here. Register this as a third model of our Boston housing de demo. Transition this to production as well. Okay. Click on OK. So if you look at the models, you'll actually see the three models. There's the first one that Richard created using a, a, a more recent version of sklearn. There's a second version, which I ran, which actually has a older version of sklearn. And then third one in which I've went ahead and re-updated the, updated the medium value data. So if I was to go back and run down, I'm gonna keep this cell for the purpose of understanding what's going on. I'm gonna run this one, but this one's now against the new model against the newer data. Cool. And it helps if I actually write the correct name. And here you go. You'll notice that actually, same 17.8, but instead of 23.79, I have a value of 23.13 now. All right, so that's it for this part. Now I'm back to the notebook. What I want to do this time is to retrain the Boston housing model and see if we can reproduce the exact same result. However, I noticed that Denny has rerun the notebook and created a new prediction. The code looks the same, but it generates a different prediction value. Is he using a new model? Let's go ahead and check. Let's go to the model page and search for Boston. Here we can see that there's already three versions in the Boston housing demo model. And the version three is now in production. No wonder the prediction is different. Let's check what's different in version two and version three. So in version two, Danny says that uh, he switched to 0.20.3. This, is like, this looks like a psychic learn library version. Um, I think if we want to reproduce the, uh, the same result, we just need to use the previous uh, psychic learn version, which is like a, um, a newer version of psychic learn. Um, and, and that's fine. And let's check version three. Uh, in version three, Danny says that uh, updating to include predictive value from four medium value, this doesn't look very correct. Wow, if I understand it correctly, he probably has updated our training data set in the delta table with some value from the prediction output. That doesn't sound like a good practice in machine learning. So let's check our delta table and see what's happened to it. Let's go back to our notebook. And then you can see that uh, now uh, I'm using a cluster uh, with the latest psychic learn version. And uh, let's check our delta table here. And in the Delta table history, we can see that there's a new version created by Denny. And uh, from the operation metrics, we can see that uh, uh, there's 173 rows updated and the total number of output rows of 506. Okay, uh, let's check zero version and like V0 and V1 version respectively and see what's the content of the two versions. So v, V0 looks pretty legit and it has a bunch of rows that with the uh, median home value been null. And the second one, 
uh, looks everything's filled and wow these looks like what Danny said that uh, the predicted value right this doesn't sound right so if I wanted to reproduce uh, my training uh, and my experiment I'll need to overwrite the table back to the zero okay so I'm, go I'm gonna go ahead and do that okay done then let's check the delta table again and we can see that we have another new version which like we roll back the previous uh, v0 and uh, um, that will like uh, revert back our data set version uh, given us uh, the data lineage uh, on the data set okay and this is uh, pretty much what we need to do for uh, getting the data set aligned and then we have the same data set and the same uh, library environment and now let's run the training uh, and see uh, what's the output and to have a clean sl slate uh, for the training I'll need to uh, clean up the previous experiment runs. So those are the previous runs. Um, just for convenience of reproducing uh, with a clean slate, let me delete all of those old runs. OK, delete it. And let's go back to the notebook and refresh the run sidebar. All of the runs gone, clean slate. And then let's go ahead and rerun the training process. So all the way to here. So let's run everything above the prediction, run all above. And after this training, new training session with the exactly same data set and exactly same scikit-learn version, I will register a new model version um, with the same way that uh, uh, we did earlier, which is like to uh, select the run with the lowest uh, RMSE and then uh, use the run artifact of that run to register a new model version. And it looks like it finished running. Uh, let's open the run sidebar and then choose RMSE and store ascending. We'll see that uh, this is the lowest RMSC, and let's go to this run and register it as the new version of our Boston housing demo model. And you can see that uh, the V4 of the model is being created. Okay, it's finished. This is the V4 of the model, and let's make it to the production. And let's do some prediction based on the V4 of the model, which is currently uh, in production state. And let's copy the prediction code here. And let's run it down here. Hmm, 23.7925. Looks like the same value we got before. To confirm, I will go back to version one and make version one production. And then try to run the prediction again because the prediction is always based on the current production uh, model version. So I wanna see if version four and version one uh, can output the same prediction value. Let's run it. Nice, exactly the same, 23.79, cool. So to recap, in this demo, we first train a linear regression model from the Boston housing data set and create the model version V1. Then we messed up with our library version and original training data set in the Delta table. And after we found the problem, we use Delta Lake's time travel feature to switch back to the original version of our training data set and rerun the training process with a consistent scikit learn library version. We end up reproducing the same result we had in our previous experiment training session. This is the end of our demo. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Richard, for those awesome demos. Hey, thank you very much for attending our awesome session today. If you want to go ahead and dive in more, please join us at mlflow.org or delta.io for more information. Thanks very much and have a great summit.